I meet a lot of church people who are struggling, and I've struggled. I've done, done my share of struggling as a believer and as a pastor. And uh, I'm beginning to realize more and more that the reason we don't get free from some of this stuff is because we do not have an intimate relationship with God. And I'm talking about an intimate relationship. And if you don't have an intimate relationship with God, then the hymn you sing, how many of you know the old hymns, some of the yeah, old hymns yeah. from church, right? If we don't have the intimate relationship with God, one of the hymns we would sing, there shall be sprinkles of blessing. <laughs> What's the real word? Showers. Showers, Showers. Showers of blessing. If you don't have an intimate relationship with God, the... the uh, the, the, hymn, the hymn, The Solid Rock, would start out like this. My hope is built on nothing much. <laughs> right? Um, the faith, our faith level might be this. I'm pretty sure my Redeemer lives. What is the true word? I know that my Redeemer lives. I'm pretty sure your parachute will open. Yeah. <laughs> I ain't jumping. <laughs> and then there's the favorite hymn, What an Acquaintance We Have in Jesus. <laughs> what do we have? Friend. A friend. A friend. We have a friend who knows all about us, but loves us anyway. Hallelujah. I live with a lady who knows all about me. <laughs> loves me anyway. At least she says she does. Oh, she does. You know, it's true that in the church there's a lot of lot of Christians who have a shallow Sunday morning experience with God. A lot, a lot of them. And there's a lot of CEOs in the church. You know what those are? Christ, Christmas, Easter only. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's. With, without really a lot of real intimacy with God. And I'm, I recognize it in myself. But my, my relationship with God is, is not as intimate as it should be. As it could be. Because as we heard this morning, prophetically, God is reaching out to us. Yeah. He desires that intimate closeness, that yeah. oneness with us. It's what He desires. And He's willing to wait as we develop it, as we grow, as we learn. Now, when a husband is truly intimate with his wife, he's not likely to be easily distracted by other women. Correct. When a wife has a truly intimate relationship with her husband, she's going to resist being attracted to other men. So intimacy is this. It's relationship insurance. It's relationship protection. And when we cry out for intimacy with God, Say, Lord, I, I really want my, to be close with you, closer with you. A lot of times we're frustrated and, and distracted because we, because we don't feel close. You know, a, lot, a lot of times we just don't feel close. And, and, and Satan, the last thing he wants is for us to be intimate with God. That's right. He'll do anything he can to sidetrack us from that, that intimate relationship because he knows that if we get that intimate relationship with God, He's going to have very little power over us. Very, we're not going to believe His lies. That's right. We're not going to be led astray by His temptations. We're not going to be easily attracted to the world and the flesh. And we're going to lose interest in those things. Bob, you've lost interest in booze. Yeah, yeah. We lose interest in those things because of the rich treasure we realize we have in Christ. Hallelujah. So real intimacy in the kingdom is 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 being just that oneness with Jesus. That the Bible calls it a union with Christ. And what that that does, if we if we can really get to that fullness of that, our lives will be fruitful. Our lives will be peaceful. Our lives will be powerful. There'll be power released through our lives because it's Him. As, I, as we sang, He is formed in us. That, that song came to mind as I was working on this. That song came to mind. Let Christ be formed in me fully. He's in me. 
but it needs to be formed in me so that he shows on the outside. He shows through my emotions. He shows through my intellect. And his character becomes our character. And there's an abundant life that, that Jesus promised becomes real when we're intimate with the King. In Romans 5, verse 21, just as sin ruled all over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what we have when we're born again. We receive that when we're born again. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of His wonderful grace? Well, of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined, now, sin is one of those lovers that comes along and wants to entice us away from our relationship with God. That's what sin is. It tries to entice us away. Yeah. If we died to sin, which we have in the spirit realm, absolutely, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten watch this, that when we were joined with Jesus Christ in baptism, we joined Him in His death? Yes. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new life. It's something that has already happened in the spirit realm. In the spirit, it has happened. It's all, it's all done. Now, it has to, now we have to work it out, right? John 17, before his crucifixion, Jesus said this, part of his prayer, this is a long prayer, but this is just part of it. Jesus said, I'm praying not only for these disciples, the, the ones that were around him at the, at the Last Supper, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Who's that? Us. Raise your hand if you're born again. Yes. That's us. That's us. He's praying what? He said, I pray that they will all be one. Here's that intimacy. Here's that oneness. I pray that they will all be one, just as you, Father, and I are one, as, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and may they be in us, so that the world will believe you sent me. The world will not believe that God sent Jesus if he cannot be seen in us. Yes, amen, amen. If we're just like everybody else. Amen. <laughs> The world cannot see Jesus oh. if He's not formed and seen in us through our words, through our attitude, through our love, through our compassion. Yes. So it's God's will that we become one with Christ. We think, well, I'm one with Christ. Well, yeah, but. Yeah. You know, it's that relationship that needs to grow. When a marriage is consummated, the Bible says the two become one flesh. You can't be more intimate than that. One flesh, the two becoming one. It's the same thing Jesus wants. He wants that oneness with us. Mark chapter 10. It says, God made them, male and female, Adam and Eve, from the beginning of creation. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. Amen. Who is our bridegroom? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus Christ is our bridegroom. We are his bride. We are his bride. And he wants that intimacy with us. Same as there is between a husband and wife. He uses marriage as an example of the relationship between him and his church, between Jesus and his church. So, intimacy with Jesus, what does it look like? So it's, it's, it, it looks like, so the world will believe, it says here. So the world will believe. What does it feel like? Well, that they'll be one, that we'll be one with him. 
that his presence becomes something that we are intimately aware of all the time. It's, it's always, he's always there. When we get that closeness, we want to, we, when we want that closeness, <laughs> we think we have to confess and repent and do battle and cry and pound the floor and pray and do all these things in order to get that closeness. Psalm 27 and verse 4, it says, The one thing I ask of the Lord, the thing I seek most, is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfection and meditating in His temple. Where is His temple today? Yes. Right here. Yep. We are collectively His temple and we are individually His temple. So the psalmist says, I just want to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. All the time I'm on this earth here, I just want to live in His house. I want to be part of His family, delighting in his perfection, meditating on him. And we don't see him, we, we don't feel him, we, we feel like we, we're not connected. We say to the Lord, where are you? Particularly when tragedy strikes our lives. We say, Lord, where are you? Where are you? And what's his answer? I'm here. I'm right here. I'm right here. Hello? <laughs> I'm right here. I've been here all the time. Isaiah 43 and verse 2. When you go through deep waters, how many have been through deep waters? Amen. When you go through deep waters and great trouble, I will be with you. Amen. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. And then in Matthew 28 and verse 20. Jesus said, be sure of this. Be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Hallelujah. I am with you. And our intimacy with Him starts with an act of faith. It's always, it's always blessed. It starts with faith. Hebrews 11, 6. It's impossible to please God without faith. Yes. Anyone who wants to come to Him must believe that there is a God and that He rewards those who sincerely seek Him. We need to be sincere <laughs> seekers. Hope is a future expectation of something we know is coming. We know it's coming. It isn't, I hope it's coming, it's we know it's coming. That's what hope is. And that hope is that we receive what God has promised. Amen. We know we're going to receive what He promised. Faith, faith is the substance of what we hope for. It's the, it's, the, it's the evidence. It's the evidence of what we can't see. We stand there and say, I know it's true. I know it's coming. I know it. I know it. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. For God bought you with a high price. Mm. Yeah. You know, uh, we're not servants. We're not, what? we're not servants of God. No. We are slaves. Um, servants are not owned. Servants are not owned. Servants are hired. Mm. We are not hired hands. Slaves. We are slaves. He owns us. We're, we're, we're willing slaves, right? We, we want to be owned by God. precious, precious um, thing, though. He owns us, but we are a precious possession. Absolutely, a precious possession. Precious. Yeah. He, but we think, of, we think of slaves as being oppressed and being beaten and being wow. all that. But, not, not in, in, but they use that word slave really? over and over again in Scripture because they, he wants us to know we are bought with a price. It says right here, we are bought with a high price. We're bought with the blood of Jesus. He owns us. He, he also draws, like he's, he, in the context of he's contrasting it between we are already slaves yes. to sin. We're slaves to sin, right. Yeah. We've changed masters. <laughs> changed owners. Right. We're now no longer a slave to sin. Yes. We're a child of God. We're a child of God, a slave, but a child. 
owned by God. Just like you own something very precious that you, you take care of it, right? Take care of it. If you, have, if you have a car, you're supposed to take care of it. You own it. You take care of it. Right. Maintain it, right? All that kind of stuff. Anyway, so when we worship in spirit and in truth, we, when we pray, when we read God's love letter to us, the Bible, there's times when we might feel disconnected, still feel disconnected because of the circumstances of our lives. But Jesus says, you are in me, and I am in you. Never forget that. We are one for eternity. We are joined. How can you get more intimate than that? Now, I'm going to have Bruce come up. I'm going to do a little illustration. Um, of now, let's say that I'm, I'm walking along, and Bruce, just, just stand there. Let's stand right there. Let's say I'm walking along, and I see Bruce, and I, and I say, Oh, hey, Bruce, how you doing, man? Doing all right? Or I could walk up to him and say, All right, how you doing there, huh? Or I could walk up and say, uh, How about that? Well, Bruce, good to see you. Or I could do this. This is best. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's Amen. 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 It's how how do we approach God? You know? <laughs> Casually? <laughs> well. <laughs> God's greatest expression of his love and intimacy is when Jesus spread his arms on the cross. Yes. And willingly died, ready to embrace us with his blood and with his embrace, ready to just reach out, just grab us and hold us. The prodigal son when he came home. And the poor well, right, that was God's illustration, wasn't it? Jesus' illustration of of, of the Father's love. I just never forget that the Father's love is so real, reaching out to us, you know. Waiting for us to come yes, to him. Yes. Waiting for us to come. Woo. And that father was, when that prodigal started home, he, the father didn't know he was, had left the pig pen and started home, did he? He didn't know that. But he's watching so carefully. Oh, right. there's a speck on the horizon. Mm -hmm. That's oh, my son. Oh, he's coming. Mm -hmm. So he hikes up his robes and he started <laughs> running. Because he sees his son coming to him. And he'll do that to us. He'll come running. And then what does he do? He grabs, he falls on him, it says. He fell on him. Embraced him. Didn't wait for an apology. Didn't need an apology. Didn't say, forgive me, Father. Didn't listen for that. Didn't want that. Just said, you're home. I bet the son felt precious right then. He felt precious. Yeah. Amazed. Mm -hmm. That's why they call it amazing grace. Hallelujah. Oh. Yes, Lord. Wow. Amazing. I've been living in the pig pen in the Gentile world. <laughs> and my father says, I don't care. I love you. My grace. Mm. Mm. Hallelujah. Wow. No greater love. Glory to God. No greater love. First John 4, verse 9. God showed how much He loved us by sending His only Son into the world so that we might have eternal life through Him. Glory to God. For God so loved the world. He loved the world. That, does that mean He loves unbelievers? Yeah. yeah. It sure does. Amen. They're not children of God yet, but He loves them. That He gave His only Son so that everyone, everyone, everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. And once we truly believe we have intimacy and oneness, our prayer life will change. Oh, hallelujah. Won't it? Yes. Oh, Amen. my. Amen. Our relationships with other people will change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do. They really will. Our attitude toward the world and the flesh and the devil will change. Our desires will change. Yeah. Our thinking will change. Yeah. I don't. I. I 
I just have to let you know that I sometimes I've got stinking thinking. Yeah. Anybody yeah. there? It happens. Mm -hmm. Stinking thinking. Here's what, and I remember this verse. I, I've been trying to memorize it, but I keep forgetting parts of it. So I'm just going to read it. Philippians 4. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. He says, here's something that's really important. Yeah. I'd like to know that the last words somebody says to you are the yeah. most important ones. No, I don't know. Often, often they are. Yeah. The okay. same, at the end of a person's life, too. Yeah, at the end of a person's life, absolutely. Oh, wow. And it says, here's, here's, what, you, here's what he says, here's, your, here's what your thinking should be like. He says, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. That verse pops into my mind every time I start thinking wrong. That's a battlefield of the mind, yeah. isn't it? That's for, there's a real battle up there going on a lot of times. And Satan tries to tell us, oh, God's far away. God doesn't care. Look what's happening to you. What's going on here? Look at he He's angry at you because of your behavior. That's what the Satan will tell you. Now, he won't be there when you need him. He's just not going to be there. Lie, lie, lie. Look at all those. Look at all those other people. They know God a lot better than you do. <laughs> I've seen God. They know how to connect with God. You don't know. I've seen God block Satan. Yeah, he does. Oh, yeah, it's happened to me. He does. Give him a body block. Believe me, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, God didn't give up. He kept yeah. blocking. Yep. I'm serious. Yeah, true. <laughs> so we got to battle these lies that come at us. Going to battle these lies that come at us and, and simply base the fact that I am a child of God. I'm a child of God. He loves me. I love Him. Not, not based on what we feel at the moment, but we walk because we walk by faith. Not by what's going on around us. The victory is ours in Christ. It's already won. The victory is won. We don't have to fight for the victory. It's done. We have to just believe that it's done. Believe that it's done. First, uh, pardon me, John 12. The truth is a kernel of wheat must be planted in the soil. Unless it dies, it will be alone, a single seed. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new life. Those who love their life in this life, uh, in this world, will what? Lose it. Lose it. They'll lose it. If you love your life, if it's all about you, it's all about me, <clears throat> you become a loser. And those who despise their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. <clears throat> that means my life in this world is not as valuable as my life in Christ. I put it second. I put it se third and second place. So we need to recognize <coughs> that the old man is dead. The old me is dead. Paul said in Galatians 2, my old self, my old self, who I used to be, has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, my fleshly person, but Christ lives in me, in my flesh, in my physical body. So we're really considered often in Scripture to consider others ahead of ourselves. Sacrificially, uh, I think someone said sacrifice. That was you, Sarah, wasn't that sacrifice? A life of sacrifice? That's what God is looking for. For other people, that means we do take care of ourselves, we pay our bills, we, we do the things we have to do in this natural life. But whenever we have an opportunity to, it's either me or them, it's always them. I want to take care of them, I want to be compassionate. They're ahead of me. Jesus said, I didn't come for you to serve me. He said, I came to serve you. That's what he said. He said, I didn't come to be served, I came to serve. If we all, here's a here's a line that I like. If we always put ourselves first, we will always be alone. Yeah. Uh, oh. Isn't that something? And then obedience comes next. Oh, great. Yeah, we love that word. Yeah. Love that word, obedience. Yeah. Don't you? We, that's become a dirty word for a lot of people. Obedience. No. It's a joyful word because when you obey the Holy Spirit, good things happen. That's true. John 15, 10. When you obey me, Jesus said, you will remain in my love, just as I obey my Father and you may remain in his love. 
1 John 5. Loving God means keeping His commandments. That's by the Holy Spirit. And really, that's not difficult, for every child of God defeats this evil world by trusting Christ to give the victory. And the ones who win this battle against the world are the ones who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Amen. So obedience simply means living the way Paul said in the last part of Galatians 2.20. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's my obedience. Simply trusting in Him. So that it, it, from all of that, from the intimacy comes that rich life, the peace of mind, the peace of heart that only He can give us. And that, through that obedience, simply that submitting myself to Him. But I'll tell you, I don't know about you, I struggle with that a lot. Hebrews 5.8 says, you think Jesus struggled with it? Yeah. Well, look at this. Hebrews 5.8, even though Jesus was God's Son, He learned obedience. And the things he suffered. Yeah. Our suffering will help us to learn obedience. Now, I got a little story here. I made some notes so I don't lose my place. But Grandpa walked into the family room after hearing these terrible cries from his little two year old grandson, Jeffy. He's standing up in his playpen, and he's crying and weeping, and he looks so pitiful in his little t-shirt and diapers. And his face was red, tears come down his eyes, and when Jeffy saw his grandpa, he did this, oh, oh, out, Papa, out, out, Papa, and who can resist that? So Grandpa walks over to the playpen and reaches down to lift his little buddy from the playpen, and then Law and Order walks in the room. Mom comes in. <laughs> no, Jeffy. You are being punished. <clears throat> you have to stay there, and Dad, you leave him right there. Now, what's the grandpa to do? His grandson's tears, reaching out for him, and he does and yet he doesn't want to interfere with the mother's discipline. He couldn't stand in the, stand to stay in the same room with the boy, try to try to read a book and ignore what's going on. And he can't turn around and just walk out without feeling like he betrayed his buddy. What, he, what does he do? Well, love found a way. Since Grandpa couldn't take Jeffy out of the playpen, he climbed in with him. And he says, if, if, if you're in the playpen, buddy, I'm in the playpen. How much time do you have to serve? <laughs> and finding his big jolly grandpa in the playpen with him, the boy found comfort, stopped crying, and enjoyed the hugs that only a grandpa could give. Mm. Jesus may not lift us out of his, our distress. But we can be sure he's with us in it. Amen, amen. Right there. And this certainty that we have comes from intimacy. Jeffy knew his grandpa. They had an intimate relationship. Grandpa knew Jeffy. They were like that. And that's intimacy. And so we develop that intimacy from living a submitted, crucified life in obedience to the Spirit, putting other people first. Uh, and so when we we're gonna we're gonna celebrate the Lord's Supper.